and I want to welcome everybody to the Iowa Nutrient Research Center uh, seminar series, and this is the fourth uh, seminar uh, this semester. Um, for those that, that haven't been on in the past, those previous three uh, seminars are archived on the Iowa Nutrient Research Center website, so go, go watch those. We had um, uh, Mike Daniels from University of Arkansas, Aaron Middlestep from the University of Nebraska, Margaret Kalsik from the Ohio State University, I use the V, and, uh, and then next month we'll have Jennifer Tank from Notre Dame that'll talk about some of the, the watershed work that's been going on in Indiana to look at the performances, performance of nutrient reduction practices. Today, we're really fortunate to have Dr. Jason Hubbard, uh, that's a professor of physical hydrology and water quality in the Davis College of Agriculture, Natural Resources and Design at West, Vir West Virginia University. Uh, Dr. Hubbard also serves as the director of the West Virginia University Institute of Water Security and Science and directs the WVU Interdisciplinary Hydrology Laboratory and he serves as assistant director of the West Virginia Agricultural and Forestry Experiment Station. And he is the West Virginia gubernatorial appointee to the Science and Technical Advisory Committee of the Chesapeake Bay Program. I got to know uh, Dr. Hubbard when we were both on the CIRA 46 um, land grant uh, multi-state committee that interfaces with the Hypoxia Task Force. So I think Dr. Hubbard brings a unique perspective uh, in thinking about um, Mississippi River Basin issues and now the Chesapeake Bay uh, issues. And um, you know, it's a real pleasure to introduce Jason and uh, have a, a former colleague of Jason, uh, um, uh, I guess a boss of mine now and probably boss of Jason at one time, uh, Dr., uh, Dean Dan Robeson. Thank you, uh, Dean Robeson, for, for joining us today. And um, I don't know, Dean Robeson, if you have any comments about Jason, otherwise we can turn it over to, to Jason for his presentation. No, thank you, Matt. Jason's a terrific colleague and a wonderful scientist, and um, maybe we should try to recruit him here. How about that? All right, there we go. Back to the Midwest. So I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Jason Hubbard. Thank you, Dr. Helmers and Dean Robeson. Thanks for the opportunity also to be here today. I'm gonna see if I can share my screen. Okay. Hopefully you are seeing a cover slide. Okay. Well, right, um, right now, right now we see kind of not in the slideshow format. It's just in, there we go. Although not, then it's very small, but yeah. Okay, thanks, Matt. Are we good now? Yeah, it's a little, for some reason, it must be on a wide screen. It's a little small, but I think that'll be okay. Okay, let me uh, see if I can do anything here to, it is on a wide screen, of course. I'm not sure what to do about that at the moment. So I'm gonna keep- That's okay, keep we'll moving. be, we'll, yep, we'll be just fine. Okay, it's, it ain't technology grand. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so again, thanks Matt uh, for the opportunity to be here. Um, I, I appreciate the invitation. Uh, it, it's, uh, I'm honored um, because I was asked to basically provide a, a bit of a synthesis of multiple um, studies that I've had the opportunity to participate in and lead and direct and initiate and, and also to stand out of the way when the timing was right. Um, and uh, so developing a talk like that is, has been an interesting uh, process. Uh, and, and I appreciate again the opportunity to be here and vet it through this group. Uh, I'm going to be supplying basically a kind of a 30,000 foot view scape, I guess, of this idea of um, experimental watershed approaches to mixed land use um, management. Um, so to get right to it, I'm going to try to argue that there is a need for a standardized watershed monitoring method, particularly in contemporary mixed use metropolitan type watersheds. Uh, many reasons for that. Uh, including that we need comparable data. Um, I will try to demonstrate here and there and complain about it as I can. 
uh, about the comparability problems that we seem to have all the time. That's inter and intra watershed comparability problems. Uh, we need to get better organized to handle contemporary challenges and a standardized type study method, I think, could lend to assisting in that dilemma. I'm gonna ex explain and describe, present the experimental watershed approach and provide some historical context for that, for that idea. Um, many here may be quite aware of the experimental watershed approach, but for those that are not, uh, and there tend to be those that are not, I've found I'm gonna go ahead and provide that context. I'm gonna provide some case study examples in brief, very much in brief, uh, and really focus on outcomes, management, and policy changes that have been affected by those uh, examples. Um, talk a little bit about what we've been learning, and then I'll provide some closing comments and discussion. Well, so in a nutshell, uh, billions of dollars are spent annually managing contemporary mixed land use watersheds for a variety of ecosystem services and uses. That's not new information for this crowd. We know this. We also understand effective contemporary watershed management decisions benefit from intra and inter watershed science based information. Unfortunately, that information is often not comparable. Uh, and, and what I mean by comparable, I mean comparability of data, comparability of results, uh, comparability of findings and the practices uh, between the watersheds. Uh, these types of attributes tend to be very challenging due to different approaches and also, of course, different needs. And there are mitigation funding complexities that include but are not limited to tracking problems. I'm going to provide the road salt analogy here. At one point uh, in an example watershed in Missouri that I'm going to provide in a few more slides, I decided that I wanted to figure out the road salt, AKA chloride budget for the watershed. And I found out that you know, I thought this was a simple question. Where's everybody getting their, their road salt? Where's all that coming from? I see these big trucks and they're salting the roads. And, and I was doing a study at the time to quantify chloride in the stream. Uh, that study, by the way, we showed that chloride persists in the stream year round, not just seasonally. It doesn't just flush out, it stays there. But in any case, what I learned is that, uh, yeah, lots of road salts are, are shipped in from a variety of places. And I'm going to get back to the salt analogy because it doesn't, doesn't end there. But it's not just that. People also go to the friendly hardware store and they pick up a bag here and a bag there. They go to the grocery store, pick up a bag there. They'll grab a bag at the gas station or they'll take a trip to uh, St. Louis, I was in Columbia, Missouri at the time, I'll take a trip to St. Louis for the day or Kansas City for the day and they'll go to a, a big box store and they'll pick up a bag of, of salt for the driveway or something there. I found out that quantifying and solving that problem wasn't going to happen very quickly and not in the amount of time I needed to and that was a job for somebody else besides me and a, a monumental undertaking. But I kind of like to use it here for this idea that tracking fiscal uh, and funding complexities in mixed use watersheds. And uh, I guess the commitments for funding and allocation of funding gets to be difficult. It's like tracking road salt. Of course, then we could get into a conversation about where it goes after that, I suppose. But there's also this sunken cost fallacy, the idea that, that we'll continue a behavior or an endeavor as a result of previously invested resources. Uh, time, those resources could be time, money, or effort. So for example, too much funding is already spent, so we can't change directions. We're committed to this. We put too much money into it, so we're not gonna change directions. The relevance here is that billions of dollars are invested annually in the US in various programs, as I already said. These, but these are big stakes, and there's a risk in suggesting that we need to, uh, for lack of better terms, pivot and change our direction. I can't help but think though that a deliberate start equals a more deliberate outcome. And in that sense, I'll, you know, I, I argue for this experimental watershed design. A random approach can equal random outcomes and may or may not be uh, helpful to where we need to go. So could we accomplish more if we're better organized out the gate? I've, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir on this one because everybody here that does research or teaches or is in this discipline, this is how we think. We wanna be better organized. We need to be better organized, right? And so should we enter problems of watershed management more deliberately, uh, deliberately, excuse me, with a recipe for success? And I would argue that that could be this experimental, in part, could be this experimental watershed study design. 
So some questions I guess I have, um, I've had for years is what if mixed land use watershed managers used a standardized monitoring design that was customizable for a given watershed and practices, urban, ag, forest, so on. What if mixed land use watershed monitoring programs were required to continue to receive, uh, were required to continue to receive federal or state funds to mitigate problems? In other words, what if there was incentive to develop these monitoring programs and designs to receive additional or to receive mitigation funding? What would happen if more data were available to better inform municipalities and stakeholders in mixed use watersheds to guide the what, how, why, where of better management practices? Note I used the word better and not best because they're not always best, but we can, do, we can do more to find out what those better practices are. Could investing in monitoring infrastructure save money? In other words, taxpayer dollars in the long term. In other words, if we make this investment early on, can it help us save money and, and, and much more so down the road. So there may be this long accepted method to reduce relative costs and be more deliberate in our decision-making at all scales. And that's called the experimental watershed approach. So I'm gonna spend just a little bit of time on, um, on this slide, because I wanna make sure that we, we get this, that I get this straight. So there are classically, so first of all, Experimental watershed studies, as I'll, as I'll explain in a minute, have been around for well over 100 years, 120 years at least in this country. Uh, there are two major kinds of these designs. One is called the paired basin experiment, and the other is called the nested scale experiment. A paired basin experiment looks like this. It, you have pairs, paired basins or paired catchments. Ideally, they're right next to each other. And some of you are already going, oh boy, we're in, we're in trouble here. And you're right. Uh, so ideally, they're next to each other and you have a calibration period where you have catchment A and catchment B and you start monitoring and you do nothing and you wait. And then you have a treatment and you wait some more. So post-treatment period would be, would be right here. And we'll say that just for simplicity's sake, what we did was we just harvested some trees. I'm gonna keep it real simple here. In fact, in the beginning, this is what experimental watershed studies were designed to do, was to monitor, to explain quantitatively the effects of forest harvest practices. So a calibration period could be thought of time as time zero. You start to monitor and you wait. You wait at least a few years. You want at least four to six years. So it takes time. So often something we don't have, right? And then you treat and you want to wait a few more years, at least four years. So I'm gonna move on to this other design here. It's called the nested scale experiment. And this, this is, starts to move into what I think of as more of a real world scenario, because it's really difficult to find paired basin experiments like this, where you have neighboring catchments that are right side by side, uh, but don't have a lot of stuff going on already. This is particularly the case I found immediately in the Midwest when I moved there from uh, the state of Idaho where I learned all about how to do these studies. And I'll explain that further in a minute. So the nested scale experiment looks kind of like this. You've got one watershed, that's all we're allocating you. You've got a calibration period, same, same thing, ideally that you start to monitor, hopefully not a lot's going on, but that's also not the real world. Things change all the time these days out there. And then you've got this post-treatment period. So maybe some, 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 some trees were harvested again and you got to monitor at any scale you know, what, what the effects of those were. In either case, you have basically these, these lines at the top uh, represent regressions. It's that simple of a treatment period and then the change in the slope of that regression, or sorry, during your, during your calibration and then the change of slope um, from your treatment. And it's really that simple. Back in, in the old, the good old days when, when, uh, when we didn't have the population density and the development issues that we have now, uh, we, could, we, could, we could get away with a lot of this. Okay, so moving on then. So in terms of the history of this experimental watershed study design, in the 1800s, these were started. Uh, they were started in other places. Fran First, France uh, had, had a couple pre-1900, uh, but in the 1800s, forest harvest, road building, erosion, stream channel degradation, water quality, aquatic health degradation led to federal initiatives and funding for watershed studies in this country. 
There were questions about harvesting trees. What were the impacts, the effects of harvesting on, on the water balance, on water yield, on water quality? In 1909, they, they, they started the Wagon Wheel Gap Experimental Watershed in Colorado, and that was basically the first one in this country. That study, by the way, is ongoing today. And that's one of the tricks of this, is to start to collect data early and then keep doing it. And of course, we're all aware of the problems with funding, funding strings and making this happen. We can discuss that at length too. Uh, hope maybe at the end or another talk. So in the 1950s and 60s, there were population pressures. We had new uh, experimental watershed studies that were started at that time. So there was a there were great, ex the great urban expansion in the 50s and 60s required that we start to learn more because we recognized that we were starting to see urban sprawl into the countryside. And what were the impacts from, from those development processes? In the 90s, there were a number of other studies and content, looking at contemporary for the forest harvest practices. Uh, and so again, until, you know, until recently, quite recently, still the vast majority of these types of studies were conducted in forested ecosystems. But I have a general comment here. This is just a, a Hubbard comment. Since about 1970, global population has doubled. I'm asking, I ask this question a lot lately. Should we reconsider what we think we understand about ecosystem management on that basis alone? And I would argue that maybe, maybe we do. Right, well, here's an example of this classic experimental watershed study design. This is uh, an example, example from Mica Creek, uh, Idaho. This happens to be uh, this, the research watershed where I did my PhD dissertation research. Uh, it's located right here, um, Red Star, kind of in the panhandle of Idaho. It was started about 1990, 1992. Uh, and again, data were needed from a typical managed forestland, looking at contemporary management practices and watershed scale studies. And so this is actually a photo from logging that occurred in 1932 uh, in the Mica Creek experimental, what became later the experimental watershed, but in Mica Creek. And they would dam this creek. This creek was nowhere near this size, by the way. They would dam this thing periodically to be able to float logs. Uh, it was it was an amazing an amazing process, and so the impacts the environmental impacts were were huge, right? And at the time that these types of studies were initiated, particularly the early 1900s, we weren't thinking a lot about the environmental impacts from a lot of these practices. But we needed to to improve our mechanistic understanding of forest harvest practices and processes, and we needed to start to make interdisciplinary connections. And I would say this last bullet is really a main driver of some of these experimental watersheds that started to spring up past the mid 1900s, 1960s and so on. Prior to that, it was really, we need to learn what the impacts of building roads are on, the, on forest and, and aquatic ecosystems. What does it mean for, the, for water flow and water yield and water quality and all of those attributes? And beyond that, we started to realize, wow, these systems are incredibly complicated and we need to start having an interdisciplinary approach to how we deal with these questions. And so new studies would show up, still most of them in forested ecosystems. So Mica Creek uh, is a paired and nested watershed design. It's about 2,700 hectares. There was six years of calibration. Remember those two paired catchments and then calibration, nothing happens. We're just monitoring four years. Of, we build roads and then we wait for four years. After four years, we collect our data, we're happy and we harvest trees. And then we wait four more years. And then in about 2003, Hubbard came along and said, hey, I wanna analyze some of those data for my dissertation. So that's what I did. And these are some of the treatments. So on the left, this is pretty easy to tell. On the left, you have a partial cut. So that's what this is. Uh, this area right in here is a partial cut. It's approximately a 50% harvest, basically, right through here. And on this side, the right side is what we call clear cut. Close enough, there's a straggler here and there, but uh, nonetheless, the clear cut. Here's the design. So this is the paired catchment right here. So this is the treatment catchment, I'm circling. And then this catchment is the calibration or the paired catchment. So we never, at the, at the time when I was there, we never did anything to change this catchment. Since then, by the way, this catchment has been harvested. Nonetheless, so, so this is where this picture right here on the left is looking Right about um, right about here, actually, in this map. So that's what we did, and these were the these are the flumes or the monitoring sites that we monitored for stream flow, 
and looked at water yield, uh, suspended sediment, macroinvertebrates, salmonids, uh, you name it, all sorts of attributes. And that's how as fat, that's as much as I'm telling you about it, because that's all the time I've got. But publications, there, were, there have been lots, lots of publications. This is not a comprehensive list. Water yield, snow hydrology. In fact, the majority of my work focused on water yield and snow hydrology. Uh, suspended sediment, I did some of that. There's also been nutrients, water temperature, cold air drainage, modeling, climate analysis, peak flows, salmonids, as I said, isotopes, and so on. Collaborations, this is a, not a comprehensive list, it included Potlatch Corporation, and this is a key point. Potlatch funded the Mica Creek Experimental Watershed uh, for at least 20 years. They put over $2 million into that process. Potlatch is one of the largest timber harvest companies in the Pacific Northwest, and they reinvested back into the country that they were working in, back into the people and the processes. So I really admire that, uh, and that's something that I learned that I, that I took with me uh, when I left. Nonetheless, there was also the Idaho, University of Idaho, the Forest Service, USDA, USGS, lots of state, state agencies, many investigators, lots of faculty, many synergies, uh, multiple institutions. It was, it's been an incredibly fruitful project and, and it's ongoing as well. In terms of policy changes, there have been many. I'm just gonna outline a couple here, but improvements to management. Uh, so studies were initiated directly after my work, looking at the removal of trees by helicopter and zip lines and all sorts of other cable systems just to try to move, remove impact to the landscape by running large equipment and that kind of thing and skid rows and, and, and all those kinds of deals. 50-50 uh, harvest uh, became a way of justifying um, fiscally uh, as, as well as uh, in terms of environmental impact the, to use the use of partial harvest processes. Um, we found uh, that, that, that that actually increased the uh, return of, of uh, growth of the trees that had, were still there. So that was actually something that's ongoing. They're still using that method. Uh, also looked at flow alterations and minimizing water quality impacts. Buffers are important, but we also learned that a 50-50 cut is, not, is too much for, for a good buffer. We need to leave more trees in that area. And retention of snowpack. We learned that we need to leave trees on the landscape in this snow dominated system so that water, that frozen lake of water is up in the hills long, as long as possible into the year. More, that's impo more important these, today than it was even when I was there. And of course, ongoing, uh, looking at ongoing harvest practices. Well, then there was a migration east. That was my migration. So in the Idaho Panhandle, you know, you've heard uh, up a creek, I was up a tree in the Idaho Panhandle. This is me installing what's called a solar pyranometer on the top of a tree. Uh, and it wasn't uncommon to find me doing something like that in the woods. Um, this is uh, where I went, I landed. So I graduated in August, uh, on August 17th of 07. I was teaching at Mizzou at, on August 20th of 07. Uh, that was a quite, a quite a ride. And I got to Columbia, Missouri and I, and I learned about Hinkson Creek and that it had been listed. And I thought, well, gee whiz, what the heck? Why can't we use an experimental watershed study design to improve this, the situation for Hinkson Creek? And of course I made lots of phone calls and I was told by my, my um, forest colleagues in the West, you can't do that, it won't work. <laughs> and they gave me a lot of good reasons why. And I did it anyway, because uh, why not, right? Um, so, what I did is, in fact, repurpose experimental watershed study studies for mixed land use watersheds, and that's what I've been doing ever since. There are lots of positive perceptions about this. I mean, one, technologies have, have advanced. That's been a real plus in the last uh, oh, 15, 16 or so years that I've been doing this in mixed land use watersheds. Uh, there's over a century of testing the method. We've got that going for us. That's good. It's accepted in the scientific community except for by those folks that say, well, you need to have a paired catchment. Uh, it's reliable and comparable in terms of the results. There's industry support and engagement and stakeholder engagement as well. Mutually beneficial, uh, collaborative. So there's research, education, management, and policies. Uh, and the design could address many of our greatest water quality and land use challenges. That's of course just me saying that, but I like to think it's right. 
less than positive perceptions. It's viewed as expensive, classically viewed as expensive. I really don't think it is anymore. Again, the technologies have advanced so much just in the last decade that the costs have been driven way down in terms of how, how we can do this. And I've been working with a lot of those instruments to, to validate that. And I feel, feel confident in saying it's just not as expensive as we used to think in terms of the instrumentation infrastructure. There is labor involved there, but uh, that's why we have research scientists and agencies and students and things like that that also love to get outside. Uh, so again, there's the labor intensive kind of uh, perception. It's a long process. As I said, uh, you do, the more data, the longer time series you have, the better off. Uh, and so you need to initiate early. It takes, so it takes longer than often desired. Not always, it depends on the question that's being asked, but you, it's good to have multiple years of data of course, the real problem is that we need answers yesterday. Uh, we're often dealing in cr uh, crisis management mode and folks want answers as quickly as possible. And so in that, in that case, we have to do other things uh, to come up with answers. But if you're also starting a program like this, then you're working on mitigating that problem for the future. Uh, the analysis and interpretation of results can be complicated in experimental, so in mixed land use watersheds, particularly where you may not have a paired catchment. Uh, and particularly where you may have multiple land uses that are occurring at the same time. And so this, the simple regression analyses, for example, may not be feasible uh, in these types of watersheds. And that's, that's a process that I've been working on and evolving with. Um, and that's, that's just an ongoing process. All right, so in Missouri, Hinkson Creek watershed, I mentioned Hinkson Creek, uh, it was listed uh, as clean, clean on the Clean Water Act uh, 303D list in 98. Uh, I started an experimental watershed study designed in 2008. That work is ongoing. Uh, the catchment area is about 231 square kilometers. A stream distance of, of Hinkson Creek is approximately 56 kilometers. Uh, it drains into Perchy Creek, which is about eight kilometers away from the Missouri River, just so for orientation. Um, it's, a, it's a typical developing mixed land use watershed in, in mid-Missouri. There's lots going on there. The red is the, is the urban area, and that is a good chunk of um, uh, the city of Columbia, Missouri. Uh, University of Missouri is right, right down here in this area right here, and around, around Site 4. Site 4, by the way, is a long-term U.S. geological survey station that has been uh, located there since the, around the mid-1960s. So I installed an additional four sites, climate stations at all of them, and then we would also analyze uh, water samples all the time. So to, again, typically, typical developing watershed, as I mentioned. And, um, and you can see here the population growth over time since the, around, the, around 1960 uh, to right around 2010, there, we're due for an update there. Uh, at the time of, of, of this work, of my work, there was about 30% um, ag, forest, or urban development. Uh, so almost equivalent, a little bit uh, more heavier on the agricultural side. And there were basic questions. What's the water quality condition? What are the pollutants? Uh, how do multiple uses affect environmental and ecological flow regimes? What's the, 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 what, are, what are the pollute, pollutant fate and transport processes? And the question that I got immediately and I got for the entire time I was there um, was what's wrong with the Hinkson? That's a direct quote. Um, and I always at that, that time had a smart alecky answer, which was, um, it was there's too many people in the watershed and you wanna fix it, remove all the people. Of course that was never taken real well, probably because it's not super realistic, but nonetheless, um, what was wrong, what's wrong with the, with Hinkson is that is time and legacy effects and all sorts of other issues that we've been able to uh, discover in the last um, 12 and more years. Uh, so a lot of collaborative adaptive, uh, there was a collaborative adaptive management program that was started there in 2011 and that was developed out of many, many, many um, collaborators coming on board uh, very, very quickly um, in the beginning because uh, with, with this idea of research, the university being involved, heavily involved in researching the creek and the watershed, uh, the entire watershed, there was a renewed interest, an invigoration from many people in the state uh, to, to do the same. Uh, and so um, 
in 2011, we had the opportunity to start a collaborative adaptive management program, and all of these folks were involved. I won't read through that entire list. You can see there's, there's a whole bunch of folks. What also happened about that time is that the state uh, handed down a TMDL, a flow-based TMDL, which, was, which contradicted some of the research data that I had collected. And that was enough for, for folks from the city and the county to say, okay, hold on, wait up. Uh, we actually have other data now that, that can help us to do better at this process. And so we did. Uh, so in terms of outcomes from the work, so studies uh, included the watershed management, suspended sediments, flow dynamics, floodplains and shallow groundwater, precipitation processes. We often have to assume homogeneity of precip, for example, across watersheds, and that's not the case, unless you're somewhere really flat, as you folks know. Uh, but we found out that precipitation was very seldom the same throughout that entire watershed. And so that leads to very different flow dynamics and pollutant flow uh, pro, uh, uh, transport regimes and so on. We looked at stream water chemistry, modeling chloride, physical habitat assessments, and so on and so forth. Nutrients, of course, um, urban heat island effects. And since uh, 2010, we've published more than 50 peer-reviewed articles. Uh, I had 18 graduate students that, that finished while I was at, um, at Mizzou that worked in that watershed. Uh, we had policy and investment changes. Uh, so road salt, we also, back to the chloride uh, uh, fun. Uh, apparently they stored chloride right on the, on the near the creek bank of, of Hinkson Creek for a number of years, for quite a while. And finally they decided that wasn't a good idea. That was a really good policy change, I think. Um, we also looked at bottomland hardwood uh, forest restoration um, in the watershed as a way to um, attenuate flows uh, and to um, consume water by through transpiration processes and so on. Uh, flood attenuation, uh, we would get flooding in the lower watershed and not just a little bit and we would also get backwatering from the Missouri River periodically. And so removal of those floodplain forests had done a lot to change the hydrodynamics, including the uh, um, floodplain connect connectivity and all of those other types of issues. Uh, we also had targeted investments based on the experimental watershed nested observations. And so that's one trick about the nested design is that you can actually locate sections of watersheds where you're, where you're um, getting an effect or a pollutant, for example, uh, that helps you to better target funding. In other words, we know the problem is in up in the upper end of the watershed. This is an arbitrary example. And so we should be looking up there because that's where the data, we have this ping in the data. So we found that there, was, there, there are pings in the data from the city dump, for example. And so we did things to change uh, how the city dump was organized. We looked at suspended sediment uh, and also of course, agriculture and, and urban. And that changed some of our, some of the riparian uh, restoration and buffers and practices, uh, particularly as uh, further down in the watershed. This watershed, Hinkson Creek watershed, of course, is uh, has other troubles because the city of Columbia sits at the bottom of it. Uh, and so the ability to attenuate flow, if, if, the, if the city was at the top of the watershed, there would be more time to attenuate flows and things like that. And so there were other issues that had to be dealt with in that regard. So I think a relevant aside, and Matt did, did the, a great job of this early on, so I don't have to hover here too long, is I had this great opportunity from about 2013 to 15 to serve with Matt and a bunch of really wonderful colleagues on the Sarah 56, uh, 46 committee, um, which again is, has the goal of promoting of effective implementation of science-based approaches to nutrient management and conservation that reduces nutrient losses to the environment. In, uh, basically the, the, the Mississippi River Basin, but primarily the corridor states at that time. I won't read through these bullets. Matt mentioned those already. That was an amazing experience for me. It, it broadened my horizons figuratively and literally in terms of how I was thinking about watershed management. And also in particular, and perhaps more silently so, I suppose my conviction that, I, that this method, this experimental watershed method uh, could be something that would be could be normalized that could be used uh, more thoroughly throughout the watershed to improve our, our ability to translate data to translate results and to improve collaborations and buy in and all these other good things. So a key observation was the ongoing that I had was an ongoing need for science based process understanding to strengthen management mitigation programs 
and an ongoing need for more organization and information. I don't think that will ever end for us. Well, then there was another migration east. In 2015, I got recruited away from the University of Missouri to be the inaugural director of the Institute of Water Security and Science uh, at West Virginia University. Uh, so from Columbia to Morgantown, West Virginia. And the second I got there, I knew I wanted to start another experimental watershed um, because why not? And they needed one too. And it's an idea that I, I firmly believe in. And so I decided that West Run watershed would be that watershed. Uh, there are other watersheds that have had more or less um, activity in them in, ter in terms of rehabilitation. West Run, not so much. And it felt to me like a great place to, to reinitiate this, this, this program that I believe so strongly in. West Run was, was and continues to be great, you know, great need of this. In 98, 2012, and 2014, it was 303D listed for pH, iron, aluminum, PA, uh, pH is twice. That doesn't mean it's twice as bad, but fecal coliform, biological, and chloride, and so on and so forth. It's, it's got a nested and paired design. Here's a pair right up, right up here. It's outlined in yellow. Catchment area, much smaller, one-tenth the side of, size of Hinkson Creek watershed, 23 square kilometers. The stream distance, about a fifth of Hinkson Creek, so 11.3 kilometers. I had five gauging sites in Hinkson Creek in, in um, mid-Missouri. I installed 22 in West Run watershed, and they've been clicking away since 2016. Uh, I wanted 22 because I really wanted to dial in on this more. It was time for me to get more at, at me the mechanistic processes leading to the changes that we observe in water quality and runoff processes. Uh, so the development is about 50% forest, 23% ag, 19% developed. And the orange is really is the developed area. You can see there's a lot of it. There happens to be at least part of an airport in this watershed. The, there's university in it, shopping malls. Uh, old, old mines, agricultural land, you name it, it's happening in West Run Watershed. Here's a look at the population uh, in, the, in the county. Uh, the city hasn't changed that, that much, uh, the city proper over, uh, over time in the last 50 or so years, but the county is growing. We see a different kind of sprawl in West Virginia in many of these, these places relative to the Midwest, as you might expect, it's very hilly country. So again, basic questions, water quality condition, biological life, recreation, how do multiple uses affect environmental ecolog ecological flow regimes, pollutant fate and transports, wetlands and shallow groundwater. And then I get in, the, but the question changed. So the, so the, the, the needs were, are very much the same, by the way, as they are anywhere, but the question changed due to the culture here. What can we really do about West Run Creek is what I hear a lot. Uh, and a lot of that is around the what I call the AMD debacle. Uh, you know, and part of that is that mining occurred. Uh, there, there are at least a dozen old mines in West Run Watershed. That's not dissimilar from much of West Virginia um, cities, by the way, and landscapes uh, and communities. Uh, and many of those mines, in fact, all of them in West Run, uh, were mined before the before the, the the mining acts in the 70s and so on. And so there's little obligation to do anything about the mines themselves. However, there is you know, the need to deal with uh, Clean Water Act uh, 303D list listing and TMDLs and all that, which are still yet to be done in West Run Creek. So in terms of policy changes and published work and studies, again, this is a recent study, uh, but we have ongoing research at rainfall and runoff and basically a lot of, this, a lot of the similar things that we had in Hinkson Creek watershed. So I won't read through all of that, uh, there have been 12 publications since 2018. Five grad students uh, of mine have finished their work in the watershed. In terms of policy investment changes, just and these are recent uh, because again, it's a recent study, but we're getting uh, a lot of cooperation now from the university, from the local agencies, uh, the city to fence riparian areas, from cattle to restore riparian areas. There's a, and there's a renewed interest in riparian restoration, uh, reduction of and removal of animal manure, manure facilities. Uh, there's an increased awareness, you know, for sure since the, since the pandemic, but there's also some of my work is, is beginning to show that there may be municipal sewage leaks uh, resulting in some of this, uh, some fecal coliforms in 
one of the local creeks. Uh, and there's a renewed interest from a watershed association that exists in the watershed for about the last 20 years, but nothing has been done. And now they feel like there's momentum and help uh, and um, to go after this and do more. So that's really very, very exciting. And of course, I have to say something about Chesapeake Bay watershed. Uh, I'm the I belong. Uh, I'm a member of the Science and Technical Advisory Committee for that for that uh, program. Uh, got the opportunity to join right away in 2016 when I arrived here and jumped right on that. Uh, the, we are going through a current review of the program for the upcoming 2025 renewal. And familiar challenges. We're not going to meet the TMDL. Uh, how many of us have these conversations these days? We're not, we're not gonna meet planned restorations. Uh, and I'm working on this, what I call the living resources paradox at the moment, which is basically we, we, we tend to list many waterways at, um, as 303D listed and so on due to living resources of some kind. Uh, it's something living that's not anymore and we would like it to be back there living. And so we, we set out to do all kinds of research to improve that, that, that condition. But in so doing, years go by, we publish lots of papers and that's great, it's great productivity and the grants come in and all of these good things. And then, but in so doing, we forget about the living resources that, that, that initiated the problems in the first place. And we forget to connect all the dots and make sure this, is this actually going to improve the condition for macro invertebrates, for example, just to throw out an example. In the Bay, of course, there are, there are lots of other organisms that we think about. We tend to lose that and we forget to connect those dots. And that's very complicated. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a paradox. And a lot of that has to do with, with organization uh, of, of the program. Uh, and I will say, you know, I have to, you know, I'm, I have a lot of pride in the Chesapeake Bay program. It's very well organized. There's a lot of extremely good scientists just, uh, on that program, just as there are in the Mississippi River Basin program. And yet with all of that effort and all, those, all, the, all the brains involved, it's, and it's just really difficult to keep all of the moving parts connected all the time. Well, so again, back to the Chesapeake Bay, programs are cut, funding is cut. We don't have enough information. I keep hearing that. The modeling program emphasis, there's a need for high resolution data, but we have modeling challenges. In other words, even in the Chesapeake Bay program, the models crash, they do, they do there too. Uh, when you when you give it too many data, lots and lots of good data, let's give it to the models and the models don't like it. It's a problem. We need more data, but we do need it because we're lacking in, in upland, in particular upland terrestrial data. And that conversation occurs constantly in the, in the stack committee. And so I can't help but always wonder if a mandated research study design would help and empower stakeholders, as I tried to demonstrate in the preceding slides. All right, so some status and updates. Um, Checking my clock here. Good. So uh, Micah Creek Experimental Watershed is, is led still to this day by Dr. Timothy Link. Uh, that was again started around 90-92. Hinkson Creek Watershed is now led by one of my former PhD students, Dr. Sean Zeiger. He's at Lincoln University but has, has reinitiated the Hinkson Creek program. Uh, in West Run it's ongoing and growing fast. Uh, a new program, I've been asked to help um, the US Forest Service to lead new research in the Furno Experimental Forest right here in West Virginia. That's an experimental watershed that was started in a forested ecosystem in 1934, uh, but primarily for silvicultural practices. And they're interested in actually implementing more of this experimental watershed study design. And I'm all for that, it's a great idea. I'm working with Dr. Levon Elbakidze, Jeff Arnold, uh, so uh, Levon's here at WVU, Jeff's at USDA ARS, Philip Gassman at Iowa State uh, with an NSF grant investigating economic drivers of crop planting, nitrogen fertilizer application and water use decisions to evaluate the effects of energy and nitrogen fertilizer prices on nitrogen runoff to the Gulf of Mexico and assess the cost of Gulf nitrogen nitrate runoff abatement and crop production, a really complicated MRB scale project. It's really fun uh, to be working on. Uh, in the Chesapeake Bay program, we're currently evaluating the state of achieving water quality goals in the Bay in prep, as I said, for the 2025 renewal. Uh, the progress has been slow, as I think I demonstrated um, previously. We've obtained about um, 15% of, of what we'd hoped, I guess, in that, in a sense, we were up from 26 and a half to 40% um, increase and improved standards. 
uh, from 85 to 16. So the program initiated in the mid 80s, as you may know. Um, and again, we have problems with modeling and nutrients and enough information, particularly increasingly, we're seeing those problems with enough data upland. Uh, and in fact, there's been discussions too about uh, looking at the development of potential uh, showcase watersheds as a way to demonstrate the study design as well as best practices in terms of watershed management, in particular agricultural watersheds. I'm also part of a new Ohio River Restoration uh, Program. Uh, it's a healthy and productive ecosystems work group. Uh, and we're working on a plan to restore the ORB and hopefully we're going to be generating some um, useful information in a document to start to fund a larger program in that watershed in the next year or two. So what are we learning? So there's all sorts of things we're learning using this method. Uh, regulatory mismanagement. These are some loose terms here, but I, 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 for lacking better terms, I'm not going to call it mismanaged regulations in terms of listing as polluted for unknown reasons. That's in fact how Hinkson Creek was listed. Uh, listing for unresolvable issues is what I'm hearing a lot about AMD here in West Virginia. Uh, sometimes we forget about practices, including deforestation, agriculture, and mining. Uh, segmented listings. So should we be thinking about listing stream systems uh, in, in, in different lengths, in different ways, so that our restoration practices are obtainable, achievable at, at all distances, and so on? Is it scientific short-sightedness? So the sediment story, so I, at, I do I work with laser particle diffraction analysis, uh, looking at suspended sediment. And some of my work has shown that urban areas have more, have finer suspended sediment than, than agricultural or forested areas, except that was masked a little bit in Hinkson Creek because the soils were finer also <laughs> in, the, in, the, uh, in the urban area. So more of a silty clay type soil. And so we said, so we have to be careful about that. Water displacement, is it karst or is it mining or is it both urban versus ag, aquatic microbes and sources of microbes and so on? Is it municipal, for example? In terms of science-based progress, the study design provides detection infrastructure and that's important. We can often find unforeseen, uh, we can deal better with unforeseen or extreme events, including floods and droughts. And we can look at long-term change time series multiple monitoring sites and the ability to better target BMPs and investments is also, in my opinion, a huge plus for these. We need to do a lot of work regarding the economics. So the money trail, as I said, where's the funding going? Is it working? And do we need to change direction? So for example, in Hinkson Creek watershed, uh, in 20, 2014, uh, an article came out that over $100 million had been spent from 1998 to 2008 with little progress. In 2008, I initiated, initiated the experimental watershed design there, spent uh, $1.5 million on that in research grants and so on in about seven, eight, eight years, and had many, many discoveries. Well, it's 1.5 million is a bit less than 100 million. Not saying they wouldn't, they wouldn't have spent all of that, but maybe they could have spent it differently. Uh, so we had a lot of science-based information to guide CAM and collaborative adaptive management and policy decisions. Uh, in West Run, we've all, there's been about 650,000 invested to date. And I will just qualify this that say that in West Run, the experimental watershed study design came in first, right? And so that was the initiation to a great extent for these other programs that are coming along now. We have a clear need for socioeconomic investment. In every, every, every single one of my studies, uh, uh, every single one of them, we don't do enough for the socioeconomics. We need to really understand and track the economics and the sociology of you know, the social side, recreation and so on of these watersheds as well. And of course, uh, there's an increasing agency, institutional and industrial interest in West Run. So the method can help to isolate land uses, climate culture, legacy effects and many other attributes that result in interacting stressors affecting aquatic ecosystem health. The watershed we see today is very much a reflection of the past and the present. And this is reflected in all the data that we collect using this design. We may need to reassess what we think we know. Uh, we made plans based on the current state and got results, but circumstances have changed. Uh, the time series of information facilitated by the method is critical for adapting to future changes and needs. So example might be nutrient criteria. If we wanna talk about expanding nutrient criteria beyond states, 
and to regions and so forth, we might need a standardized method to do better job of, the, of doing that uh, in terms of monitoring. Uh, the EW approach enables these discoveries and supplies quantitative information to advance management and policy decisions. So many questions still need answers. You know, what data are needed? What's the accuracy and precision? Does responsible watershed management require research grade? It's another great conversation. Which stakeholder groups should we ask for help? What do we want the watershed to look like? That's a great question, I think. How do we want contemporary watersheds to function and support natural resources? How do we convince policymakers that the investment is worth it in the long run, the investment being the experimental watershed study design? And do we need a system that will continue to supply needed information as population continues to grow or shrink as we change our land use practices so we can make most informed management practice decisions now and in the future? Here are a few questions or statements, I guess, that I've heard over the years. Uh, and, and I preface this by this statement at the top, we should not be afraid to ask difficult questions, even if answers mean changing our minds. Uh, for example, we've invested $100 million. What do you mean we need to change our strategy? I've, I've heard that one. Another one, the government has invested billions in the program for modeling. We can't pivot on that and risk our reputation. I hear that one. I've heard that recently. We only need to monitor at major river confluences. We don't need to fund upland monitoring. I've heard that as well. Can you believe it? Uh, so, so all of these are these are hurdles and questions that we have to ask, and we have to be brave enough to discuss, uh, knowing that they're they're difficult topics. Right. So, closing in closing, the experimental watershed study approach may organize efforts, uh, reduce long-term costs, supply more deliberate information for management of mixed land use watersheds. The approach can be customized by the watershed. As you've seen in my examples, I, in the ones that I've been had the opportunity to lead, they're customized by the watershed. Uh, I had five, in the, five sites in Missouri, I have 22 here. So you can, the approach is, is completely customizable and it's also vetted over a century of using these studies. Uh, in my opinion, you can save money in the long term. You can provide tangible results the money issue, by the way, I'm back up. We're work, I'm working on that. That looks like a, a next uh, phase of this work that I, that I need to invest uh, some time in is really figuring out how to track the funding and justify the costs better. Uh, a mutually, it's a mutually beneficial program. It includes researchers, educators, managers, policymakers. Universities can serve as an honest broker in the process. That's also worked out really well. And it provides a basis for collaborative adaptive management process encourages stakeholder engagement, trust and support and buy-in, super important. And that's it. I thank you for, for your time, uh, for listening. And I am very curious about what types of feedback that you might have for me at this time. Thanks again. Thanks, thanks Jason so much. And I guess I would say if folks want to um, unmute themselves or uh, take their video off. If you have any uh, questions, uh, feel free to, to ask those. Um, I guess there is one here, the, uh, the last one from Ann. Talk about logistics. What have you learned about how to effectively set up the experimental watershed um, design study? Logistics, wow. Uh, really great question, Ann, thanks so much. Logistics. Step one, um, you know, that's easy. Uh, it, for, that's been easy. It's been easy to, for me to find the watersheds, the culprits, uh, because so many of them need help. And it's, I, it's my intention to try to provide some of that assistance. The other, the other, the next step is where do you put these sites and where do you install them? And so that's, that's a massive um, undertaking using GIS. Uh, it's a, as well as looking at land ownerships, uh, where, you, where do you need access? Um, who do you need to talk to? Preferably everyone. Uh, I've tried to communicate with everyone I could when initiating these, pro these programs. Uh, one of the first calls I made when I got to Morgantown was I called um, uh, Morgantown Utility Board and I said, hey, I want to initiate this project in West Run Watershed. Can we collaborate? And they're like, no. Uh, and I said, I'm like, okay. <laughs> and, they're saying, they're, and their response was, well, we, we realized you're probably going to find some stuff. And so we have to be careful about that. We'll support your work, uh, but we have to do that kind of behind the scenes. And so there are all of these types of relationships that have to be navigated up front. And it's really important to be cautious at the outset. And 
people get uh, impatient, right? Because also folks want instantaneous results, but you cannot rush uh, these kinds of relationships that require a lot of trust. And that just uh, means taking the time. The next is to visit sites, to get to know your watershed, get out in it and figure out where, where um, study sites can be installed. And then of course the money issue, right? And then of course there are plenty of issues uh, besides that, but I'll, I could talk about the funding uh, side of this a little bit if you want to, but I don't wanna take time from anyone else that may have questions. And, and I'd be happy to follow up anytime on that. Are there others that uh, wanna unmute and ask any questions? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so when you're in a landscape uh, like uh, the, the Des Moines Love of Iowa, right? So this is a pretty young landscape. We come in and put tile drains in these systems. Um, the streams are deeply incised. Um, so we, we run this long-term trajectory for streams establishing some new equilibrium. Um, how do you deal with these sort of, this sort of irre almost irreversible uh, shift? Um, when you're thinking about applying an experimental, wa uh, experimental watershed approach to these systems, um, how do you do that? And I'm still struggling a little bit. Um, I, if I had read some of the material ahead of time, maybe it would have helped me with understanding what, what exactly this means. So if, if you could put it in the context of a river here, so let's so I have a river, we're largely agricultural with interspersed um, small communities, um, a few major, by Iowa standards, major metropolitan areas uh, um, and small communities like Ames, you know, which is like say 50,000-ish population. Um, how does uh, so our, our mixed urban our mixed land use is a lot in some ways a lot less mixed? What's the scale we should be thinking about? There was a lot in that. So I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, 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 I'm filtering. <laughs> um, I guess I guess I would have to I, you know to reasonably answer that I would need more I would need to, more information. Um, my, my instantaneous naive response is just get started. Um, number one, just get started. Uh, it's kind of funny, you just get started, take a stab at it and get started and all sorts of new information comes pretty quickly. Um, and you learn a lot in terms of that. I think I hear a little bit about scope. I think I heard something too about um, how do you do this in a dynamic system that's, that's changing? constantly, dramatically. Um, well, you know, so that's, that's part of the equation is that if you, if you it, we're all living in these dynamic systems these days. So again, I recommend you just get started and, and, and to start to collect data. The other is the scope and the scale issue. I, maybe what questions are preeminent? Um, and I will say, I, I wanna qualify that by you know, it's it's the it's having these neighboring monitoring sites that allow you to be able to pinpoint land use specific land use practice impacts. Uh, the reason I have 22 sites in a very tiny watershed called West Run Watershed is there are so many different things happening in this watershed all the time, constantly, that I really wanted a lot of monitoring sites so I could actually, well as a geeky scientist make some really cool looking graphs that show impacts related to land use practices. But not just that, to be able to, to, to provide information, quantitative information and evidence that some practices, specific land use practices in specific places are impacting the aquatic ecosystem more than others. For example, there's, a, there's one tributary, it's reach 15, uh, it's a, I don't, I don't name these in complicated ways. It's number 15 and, and it drains a, a shopping mall. We have stormwater runoff surges of temperature in excess, in excess of 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius, just from that one drainage. I don't see that much of a blip 
in, from any of the other drainages. And so there's an example of where some, some strategic mitigation could offset some of that impact that we know impacts the stream having, having temperature surges like that. Well, let, let, me, let me ask you, maybe I can focus this. 20-ish um, years ago, uh, we submitted a project proposal to DNR funding to 319 um, to look at uh, water quality. And, and, but they wanted us to identify which of the hundreds of small watersheds we would look at was causing them, was contributing the most load. So I, I guess we have such a uniform landscape that um, for nitrate loads, for example, there aren't those hot spots that we would identify, right? So every place is a problem. Um, so in, in, is this, I, was, I, was, I'm, I'm, I lost, I'm not sure. So you're, you're saying you make the experimental watershed approach, or are you, are you really positioning for a paired watershed approach? No, in fact, every single one, every single one of my watersheds have pretty much predominantly been scale nested uh, since I left Idaho, <laughs> unfortunately. But that's but that's the real world that we live in in the Midwest and 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 here as well. Uh, and and so um, I think what I hear you saying is that you know you're you're being asked for where's the low hanging fruit? Where can we spend our mitigation dollars most wisely to take out the biggest offenders? But I also think I hear you're saying that they're all offensive. And so where do you start? And, and so I guess uh, you know, that's a difficult question for me. It would be terribly presumptuous for me to, to make, to suggest too much here. So what I would do first is what you already know, which I would talk to the people that have been around long enough to say, well, okay, well, let's do the best we can here. Where do you wanna start? And, and, and what, are those, what are those numbers look like? What are the, what are the quantitative values of all of the offenders, and then you know somebody will nudge out ahead, and you just start chipping away at it. So, um, let me, so, so the, the the Micah Creek watershed study, you described that as a paired and nested watershed yes, study with six right, years right. of calibration. So, that's what I mean when I say paired watershed. Uh, but is that different than what you're propo proposing for? Well, yeah, it, it is in a way because we don't have, you know, out, out in the Midwest and, and many, many, if not, well, most places globally don't have the luxury of, an, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a paired watershed anymore. There's no time, there's no calibration. Uh, mm -hmm. All we have is, is, is start time zero. And that's why I said the calibration start date, this could all be also be considered as time zero. And so when it comes to, to doing this work in mixed use watershed, where we may have many, many different impacts or land uses occurring at the same time, that's, you know, you just have to start the monitoring. I did find out in Hinkson Creek in mid-Missouri that until I had four years of data, I really could not do much because the beauty of the paired catchment, and I didn't mention this earlier and I apologize, is and, and of having that, that period of time is that you're able to start to weed out the effects of climate. That's, that's part of the, the, um, what's really important about this is that you can start to deal with issues like precip regime and dealing with, the, with temperature and issues like that and get and focus more so on the land use impacts themselves. I really feel like I haven't done well for you here and I apologize. It's a long conversation and I, one that I would love to have and um, would be very happy to follow up anytime. Well, yeah, uh, th yeah that's maybe the, a good place to, to leave it because I think that uh, there may be a few of us that, that are kind of interested in this, uh, Jason, and maybe there's a, you know, an opportunity for some further, further discussion around this and, and thinking about what we do um, you know, here around, around Iowa State and some of the watersheds here. So um, with that, um, in the interest of time, I really want to thank Dr. Jason Hubbard for the, for the presentation today. Um, I think very stimulating and gives us a lot to think about and things to, uh, to aspire to with, with some of our monitoring. And uh, just want to also say, uh, tune in next month. Uh, we'll have Jennifer Tank uh, from uh, Notre Dame uh, talking about uh, some uh, watershed work in Indiana. So with that, uh, thanks everybody and uh, have a great rest of the day. Matt, thanks. And thanks to the entire audience. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate the opportunity. Take care and stay well.